I'm so blessed with very active uh, allergies. I just love it. <laughs> uh, there was a movie a couple years ago called 127 Hours. I didn't see it, but uh, it's a true story, and it came from uh, uh, the book written by the author who experienced the story. Uh, uh, it was called uh, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And the story is about this hiker, mountain climber, who's very avid at it, who uh, is out in Utah, I think, and he's hiking alone, and a boulder falls and pins him between these two big boulders and, and pins him down and crushes his arm, and he's stuck, he can't get out. So uh, he knows he only has a few days to live, so he makes this decision. I have to self-amputate my arm. So that's the movie. Spoiler, spoiler alert. He does it. He um, has to face himself. So let's get into his head for a moment if we can. We're that hiker. And we're all out there all alone, not afraid of being alone. And then this boulder comes down crashing and pales us against these two boulders and we're stuck. And we know we can't get it off. And if I have five days, if I don't get it off, I'll be dead. So he first goes through the emotions, probably anger. Why did I come alone? Why? He met a couple other people on the way. Why didn't I ask him to go with me or I go with them? No, I had to do this alone like an idiot. And then he faces his own uh, fears. He begins to realize what he has to do. And he has to realize that he has to do it to himself. And so he goes through whatever that process of facing it, and then the day comes where he actually has to do it. Cut off his arm to save his life. He does. He wanders along. He finally gets rescued. And he lives to write this book. Or, another example. I love playing the piano. I am not as good as this gentleman. I'm, I play at the piano. <clears throat> love classical music. Love it. And I love watching documentaries about these very young artists who are really, really talented, really gifted. Technically, they can play anything. But the thing that they're missing is the maturity to interpret music. They, they play technically perfectly and very expressively, but there's, there's things that you can get out of music, a tone, a touch, that, that are just incredible. And so they go take a master class from a a teacher who's been playing for 40 or 50 years and is very mature in their interpretation of music. And I love when this moment comes in the documentary where, the, uh, where the, uh, this grand teacher, or it could be a conductor, says, okay, this little phrase that you're playing, technically it's perfectly, but I need you to imagine this. There's a downpour of rain, and there's this big plant with these huge leaves, and this leaf fills up, and the clear sky comes out, the sun comes out, is shining down on this water, and one drip right over the edge of this plant, this leaf, and then it falls. That's how you play that part. And they go, ah, I get it. And then they play it technically perfectly again, but they capture that moment, whatever that is. These two examples, I think, are what Jesus is talking about in the Scripture today. He's talking about a moment. Now, we could just simply say he's using hyperbole, which he often does, and the Scripture is loaded with hyperbole. Uh, I'm going to ask these kids here. Does anybody know what hyperbole is? You've heard me say the word before. <gasps> okay, what is it? Gross exaggeration, yes. It's, it's gross exaggeration. It's like this. Let's say this, he's not, he's a, he's a perfect angel, but he, he's sitting here. Let's say I see him talking and I go like this. I'm going to manhandle you for a second, okay? Just, a, just an example. If you don't shut up, I'm going to kill you. I'm not going to kill him. But people say hyperbolic things like that to make a point. And, and people, when they're desperate, they often do it. Well, Jesus used hyperbole many times. Exaggerations, and you could look at this today as one. In fact, since I'm talking here right in front of the catechumens, did anybody find it a little disturbing for Jesus to say, if you want to follow me, you must hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brother, hate your sister, and hate yourself, or don't follow me. Does that sound like Jesus? Huh? Not at all. 
Jesus would never mean that. But what I think, more than hyperbole, what Jesus is doing is taking us right to the edge to, to, to notice something with different eyes. Like that, like that man who has to face cutting off his arm. He has to go through all of his emotions and all these thoughts to say, i got to do it now. And if he hadn't gone through all of that, he probably couldn't get to the point to say, i got to do it now. Or like that student who listens to the master teacher and he tells him this description and this drop of water just before it drops and then, poof, and he says, ah. And if he didn't take him there, he'd play it technically perfectly but wouldn't catch, catch the real power of it. Now Jesus was a profound spiritual teacher. His spirituality, it wasn't something that he learned in his head and then just, it came out of his spirit. And everybody noticed it. They'd often say, who are you? Where did you get all this? How do you know this? When Jesus spoke this truth, it flowed out of him. And he said, if you want to follow me, you have to hate your mother, hate your father, hate your brother, hate your sister, hate your spouse, hate yourself. What is he saying? You've got to be at this moment, this, this place, where you let go of things, where, where you say, not even I am important. It, 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 of course we are, but it's, it's this moment. And it's very hard to describe. It's something like this. You pass by this building. It's not a church, pretend. Not a church. It's a beautiful hall where elegant, elegant parties take place. And you hear this music and you see this light flashing out through the windows. You come up to the door and you peek in. And you say, oh my God, look at this party. But you don't come in. You admire it from outside. Now that's religion. That's prayer. That's mass. That's everything. Novenas. It's coming to the door and looking in, but it isn't getting in yet. Prayer is just the doorway. Prayer prepares our spirit. But when we pray, if we get inside, is where we get transformed. Now, and again, Jesus does this to us all the time. Jesus said we have to forgive each other. Now, anyone who knows the Our Father, I'm 66, so I bet I've said it at least 10,000 times, probably more. And I've said that phrase, Father, you forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. I've said it 10,000 times, Father, you forgive me like I forgive the people who have hurt me. Now, it's an easy thing to say, we say it again and again, but to do it? We're at the doorway this will transform us when we go through and actually let go of our anger and hatred and actually forgive. Jesus did the example for us on the cross. The cross is iconic. There is Jesus hanging on the cross, but he's not just hanging on the cross. He's been accused, tried, condemned to death. They stripped him. They beat him. They spit on him. They made fun of him. You're a king, so let us give you a crown. But the crown was thorns like this. It stuck in his head. Okay, you can carry the cross that you're going to hang on. He carried it. Then they nailed him to it. Then they lifted him up, and he's dying, going through enormous pain and enormous rejection. And out of that moment, he can say, Father, forgive them all. They know not what they do. Where did that come from? So to get there, how do you do it? Jesus says you have to let go of everything. All of your possessions, even yourself. If you're hanging on, well, you'll not discover it. So like in the introduction I said today, um, do we have possessions or do possessions have us? You know, this last month, we've heard of all these wildfires through California, the floods, now the hurricanes over on the East Coast. People lost everything. They didn't just lose a house, they lost everything in it, pictures, and gifts that were given to them that were special, and, and perhaps uh, the wedding necklace that they wore on their wedding day, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, things that were a part of their heart, memories that are wrapped up in physical things, but now those physical things are gone. They lost everything. And the important question is, can they lose it and not lose hope and faith and love. Now some people will lose it 
and the rest of their life they'll be like this. Miserable. Why God? Why me? They can't let go. And others let go long before the flood or fire came. Long before they said, God, thank you for this beautiful home and everything in it. And if I lose it tomorrow, well, I appreciate that I had it. And when they lose it, they had already let go. Is that me? It is. They had already let go. And Jesus is trying to prepare us for that. How do we live in a way that things don't possess us? So he says it very powerfully. You must hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brother, hate your sister, hate your spouse, hate your very self. Pick up your cross and follow me. And be careful. If you think that possessions are everything, they're not. There's something deeper. There's something more. And that's the life inside you that you have to discover.